integrative medicine at Memorial Sloan Kettering. And I'm going to talk a little bit about integrative medicine. First, we're going to discuss kind of what it is and isn't, uh, the kind of six pillars of health, as we like to say. And then I'll talk about specific modalities, as well as kind of really common symptoms that people have and the way that the treatments can help them. And then we'll have a super rich discussion afterwards. Uh, I want to I don't want to pause too much during the, the session, if at all possible, so that we can get through all the information, uh, but there is usually a lot of great discussion afterwards, so I'll be happy to answer all your questions. All right, so first, what is integrative medicine? This is kind of often confused or kind of lumped together with complementary and alternative, and I really prefer the integrative kind of terminology because we really do sit inside all three of these things, right? So we use very traditional medicine as well as complementary medicine and then our own self-care. Uh, the most important part I think is that we're really evidence-based. So just like when you see your oncologist and they say, these are the treatments that have been shown to be the most effective for your particular type of cancer, we try and push that forward through integrative medicine as well. So these are the treatments that have been shown to be the most beneficial for this symptom or this thing. Um, and then we also try to do a lot of research to help kind of just move the field in general. We are never being used or we prefer not to be used, I should say, as a, like instead of traditional care, we really want to be in addition to. And I'd say in addition to kind of promoting wellness and, and health, we're really focused on kind of symptom management in particular. So we want to make sure we're not interfering with anything that's kind of traditionally been given and enhance it whenever possible. These are our six pillars of health, so to speak. Um, and I think all of these things are really important, right? So we wanna have a really healthy diet. We wanna be able to exercise regularly, engage in stress reduction, have a loving and supportive environment, get good quality sleep, and then experience joy. So I'm gonna talk about kind of each of these things. Now, this is a tricky subject, healthy eating in general, and especially in the setting of ovarian cancer, because you know many people may have had an experience either with a small bowel obstruction or have been told because of kind of extensive abdominal surgery that there is a risk of small bowel obstruction. So, you know, take this with the you know, the advice that you've previously been given. But in general, we want to have five to seven servings of fruits and vegetables a day. And I have the rainbow here because really there's no good or bad food or vegetable, right? We want the whole range. So picking all the different types, squash and um, bananas and zucchinis, whatever that might be. Uh, a serving is generally the size of your fist, so like one apple or maybe um, a cup of berries. And then whole grains, this is again, I think one of those areas, whole grains is typically nothing that is a uh, refined carbohydrate, right? So like quinoa, millet, oats. Uh, but again, if you've had a extensive bowel surgery, that might not be and you may not be able to tolerate that. So then eating more refined carbohydrates would be appropriate for you. Um, but in general, if there's no other kind of contraindications, eating more whole grains rather than refined carbohydrates. And then nuts, beans, seeds, legumes, these are all really great nut butters for people that can't tolerate like nuts or seeds in particular can be nice. You can add those to smoothies. We want to limit red meat if at all possible. So, you know, anything that's not a bird or a fish is essentially considered red meat. Uh, although I know the pork had a very successful run at being called the other white meat, it is in fact still red. Um, so really kind of focusing more in the bird and fish categories. And then for the fish, you want that to be the smaller, fattier fish. Uh, so things like salmon, mackerel, anchovies. There's a great website. Um, the Environmental Working Group has a website. It's called ewg.org. 
and they have a fantastic information on seafood and what has kind of like high mercury levels versus low mercury levels and kind of good options to choose from. So that's, I think, a really nice way to get some good information. And then we have exercise. Now we all know how important exercise is, right? It helps improve our mood. It helps fatigue associated with treatment. It decreases anxiety, um, but it's difficult to do right now, right? So I know a lot of people are like, oh, I can't go to the gym, the, it's cold outside, but walking counts, right? So we want 30 minutes of kind of moderate intensity. So a light sweat uh, would be sufficient. And you don't need to do all 30 minutes in one shot. You can kind of split that up and do kind of 15 minutes twice a day or even 10 minutes three times a day. And depending on your lifestyle, it may even be better to kind of split it up throughout the day if you have kind of a sedentary job or um, you're not moving very much during the day, then it might be good to do like a 10 minute walk in the morning and then one in the afternoon and then one in the evening. Um, and then you also want to have some kind of like light with resistance, uh, sorry, light weight or resistance training. So thinking of like two to three pounds of weights or resistance bands, and you want to do that maybe two or three times a week. So this is really important for improving muscle mass and bone health because the force of the muscle on the bones will really help protect our bones, not only from potential fractures, but also um, helps build bone itself. Now, stress reduction is something that I think is extremely important. And I do sometimes talk to people and they tell me, I don't have any stress, but I find that really hard to believe, but maybe that's just me. I feel life can be really stressful. I mean, we're in a pandemic, so that in and of itself, um, but having a daily kind of practice, I think is super helpful. What happens during stress is a fight or flight response. I don't know if you guys have heard about this, probably many of you have. This is kind of, if you were to see, say, a bear, um, you know, your body will kind of go through these chemical changes where it increases your heart rate, your blood pressure, glucose and fat get pushed into our bloodstream, our adrenaline levels pick up so that we are prepared to either fight the bear or run from the bear. And the same things happen, whether it's a bear or we're stuck in traffic and we're getting more and more worked up or it's work stress or family stress or any of that stuff. So we want to be able to kind of calm our minds and calm our bodies and calm the internal environment. It doesn't really matter what it is that you pick for stress reduction. So I personally really like meditation and I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Uh, but journaling can be another really nice way to reduce stress. And this can be kind of a, a dear diary. This is how my day was. Or you can set kind of a number of pages, like I'm going to write two pages in the morning and just whatever comes to mind, kind of stream of conscious. Um, it can be um, like a five minutes. So um, for five minutes, I'm just going to write whatever's on my mind. That can be really nice. And then some of these other kind of mind body activities like yoga or Tai Chi, some people need a little bit more of an active kind of stress reduction. Uh, those are also fantastic ways. And it doesn't have to be just one thing, right? So you can pick maybe journaling today and yoga tomorrow and meditation the next day. But having something each day, I think is really important because we want to kind of set up our, our day, um, either opening it or closing it with kind of a calm mind, calm body. And then in, in times of stress, that practice can be called upon, right? So when things do get kind of hectic and crazy, you can be like, okay, I know how to calm myself. Like I've got this, I've been doing this for a while. All right, sleep is something else that is very near and dear to my heart. Sorry, I just dropped something. Um, I treat insomnia. So I really see a lot of this in the cancer population. 10%, I think about of people without, you know, healthy people have insomnia or sleep disturbance, but up to 50% of people who have been diagnosed with cancer will develop a sleep disturbance. And this occurs for a variety of reasons, treatments and symptoms and other things. So some things just in general that can be helpful is again, exercise. Um, 
we want to stop caffeine by 12 noon. That's kind of my hard stop for that. And that includes not just coffee, but things like green tea or black tea, sodas, any kind of caffeine, definitely earlier in the day rather than later. Napping, there's something called sleep drive that is kind of the chemical changes that occur in our bodies throughout the day. Um, where we build up kind of melatonin and other things that make us more and more sleepy until we reach some kind of sleepiness threshold. And if there's a 24 hours in a day and we sleep for say eight of those hours, then we need 16 hours of wake time to be able to be tired enough to fall asleep at night. So imagine if you sleep say 10 p.m. to 6 a.m. every day. If you wake up at 6 a.m. and then you nap at three from three to four or three to five or whenever, then it's gonna be very hard for you to fall asleep at 10. So something that people don't really think about too much, but if you do need to nap, because certainly it can be necessary, especially when you're on treatment, try and keep the naps short, so not more than 30 minutes, and try to do them earlier in the day. I prefer kind of before 2 p.m. so that it doesn't interfere with falling asleep at night. Now, Wind down time is, I think, particularly important during the pandemic because people are working from home, homeschooling, we're doing so many things at the house, and so it's kind of like 24-7 access. Having some time where we can kind of unwind and close all the, the stresses throughout the day is important. So rather than kind of like working up until bedtime and then shutting the computer and getting into bed and being like, why can't I go to sleep right now? We wanna kind of give ourselves at least an hour and a half of kind of downtime. It can be reading, it can be watching TV, it can be a variety of things, but we wanna just have a time to rest and relax. Then fluid intake, this is another thing that I think is really, really common. You know, you're told, especially during treatment, like get two liters or sometimes more of fluid in a day. And what happens, do you like, drink your water, maybe a cup or two, and then it's nine o'clock at night and you're like, oh my gosh, I have to get all this water in. So you start chugging water and then you're up all night going to the bathroom. So I do recommend trying to wake up, start your day with a big glass of water and then really stay on top of it. So stay well hydrated throughout the day. They have water bottles that have kind of like times on them. So you can kind of have like little goals for how much you wanna be drinking by whatever time. And then stopping fluids two hours prior to bedtime, just to decrease the number of times you have to wake up to go to the bathroom at night. Also will help decrease, if you remain well hydrated during the day, it will decrease that dryness that, that can occur at night. Blue light exposure may be something you guys have heard of, and I did mention kind of, you know, using television or something to relax at night, which is completely fine, um, but we do want to decrease blue light. So this is the light from our devices. Um, typically, I say about two hours prior to bedtime, making that. If you're if you're on an Apple device, you can. There's something called um, night shift that you can set in the settings. And on Android, um, I believe it's called either blue light filter or night light. Again, under settings, so you can actually set that so that your blue light filters are already on well before you're ready to go into bed. Um, and then from TV, you can get either blue light blockers. So there's um, these kind of, they're yellow tinted generally, glasses that or goggles that can go over prescription glasses, or they have actual, they look like regular prescription glasses, but have no prescription in them. That is a blue light filter. So also using these for the computer can be really helpful. And then I think one of the most important things is sticking to a sleep schedule. So. If you imagine, again, if we go back to that sleep drive, if you wake up at six o'clock one day and then nine o'clock the next, and then eight o'clock the next, and then 4 a.m. the next, you're gonna have various times of sleepiness in the evening, right? So the earlier you wake up, the earlier you're sleeping at night, and the later you wake up, the later you're gonna be tired at night. So kind of having a more regular routine is really important. I stuck all of these together, love, support, and joy, because I do think they kind of intertwine. Um, you know, we want to have a really strong support system, and this can come from friends, from family, 
um, from support groups like this one, uh, you know, reaching out to your social worker. Um, there's Facebook groups, there's all kinds of groups out there, but you know, this is a really trying time, especially now. Um, and it's hard to kind of engage with people the way we used to. So really trying to reach out and connect with people is so important. And then joy, again, I feel like this is something that is maybe a little bit harder to find during a pandemic. You know, our lives aren't really that, um, I don't know, exotic for lack of a better word, but really kind of picking the little things like, uh, you know, finding joy in really the very simple things. And maybe that's something for a journal entry, right? Like a little gratitude um, entry, three things that you found that brought you a little bit of joy today would be really nice. Um, but do make a point. There's been several research studies that have shown how laughter as medicine, it really helps. It decreases inflammation, improves our immune system. Um, and same, you know, loneliness and isolation can be just as detrimental as chronic alcoholism. So on our actual physical health. So please, if you need anything, reach out, but definitely um, engage as much as possible with loved ones. All right, so now I'm gonna move on to kind of more specific treatments or therapies that I use um, or that we use in integrative medicine. I'll talk about them specifically and then I'll get to the um, specific symptoms where they can be helpful. All right, so massage, who doesn't love a good massage, right? I know I do. Um, there's all different types of massage. I would say in an oncology kind of population, we want to really be more medically focused. So a medical massage, not really a spa massage. We don't want anything really rough or deep. We want to be mindful. Um, if there's any kind of sites of real pain, we, we don't want to be pushing on those, obviously. So these are kind of some of the typical types of massage that we use in integrative medicine at MSK. Um, I'll pick out just a couple. Uh, Reiki, because some of you may not have heard of that, is more of an energy medicine. And it's typically, you don't even have to have any hands on at all. It can be done all kind of above the body or with light touching. Um, but they do tend to use in kind of a hospital setting or a medical setting, a Reiki massage. So it's very light massage with some of that energy work entwined into that. Um, and then Neuromuscular therapy is really kind of more um, pressure points. Uh, it's kind of similar to myofascial release. Um, and then the manual lymph drainage, many of you may have heard of this. This is a lot of times um, done to help with lymphedema. And this can be done in physical therapy or occupational therapy settings, as well as kind of in a more typical medical massage setting. So any of these can be intertwined and used in one setting um, in, you know, like one massage session, depending on what the symptoms are. But these are kind of the more common things that we do. Now meditation, which is, as I said, my favorite. Um, again, there's so many different types of meditation, but the main idea here is there's some focused attention. So in mindfulness, it's focus on the moment, on the present. Our mind wanders, and then we notice that it's wandered, and we non-judgmentally bring it back to whatever that focus is. In transcendental meditation, that's usually a mantra. Um, loving kindness is kind of sending love to yourself and others, um, or focused attention, kind of delving into some particular object or sensation in the body. The way that I think meditation is helpful is with practice. It is something that can help us kind of gain greater control of our minds. So like I said before, you kind of start off and say you're focused on your breath and I'm breathing and I'm breathing. And then I start thinking about, oh, what am I gonna make for dinner? And what's gonna happen later, da, 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 da. And then you're like, oh my gosh, I was meditating. Hang on, let me go back to my breath. That's really the practice of meditation. So you have a focus, your mind wanders, you bring it back to the focus, your mind wanders, you bring it back. And with time and practice, just like learning an instrument, learning a language, you get better at holding that focused attention for longer you notice more quickly when your mind has wandered and you're able to bring it back to that spot. 
Um, so I, I really like it for a lot of those reasons. Um, I, again, I think five minutes, a daily practice, five minutes, it doesn't have to be extensive, can be really great. You know, five minutes each day of a little bit of some type of meditation, I think can, can reap big benefits. Then we have acupuncture. I'm sure, you know, this is not obviously a very bizarre modality, but for those of you that are not familiar with acupuncture or how it's given, I just wanted to give a little bit of background. The needles are very, very fine. They're the width of a human hair and you can actually bend them. So if, um, if you can see my cursor, this is actually not the needle, that is the holder. And the needle is really just that little thin part right there. So they just, they come in a little tube and the acupuncturist will kind of just place the tube on the skin and tap the needle into just the surface of the skin. It is nowhere near like a blood draw um, or a port access. It is very, very fine. You may feel one or two, but it's nothing, like I said, like a blood draw. So they, there's meridians that run throughout our body in traditional Chinese medicine. Um, and this is where the symptoms and the points are kind of based. So depending on what your symptom is, will depend on kind of where they treat, but it's not necessarily like, oh, I have nausea. So they are going to put a needle in my stomach, say the nausea point is actually here. Um, so there's also kind of a, a worry sometimes about like, oh, having, you know, if you look at pictures, there's like a lot of needles in people's faces or other things for dramatic effect, but that's not really what it's like. It's usually only a few points. Um, multiple symptoms can be treated at once. So for example, anxiety and nausea or constipation and sleep, you know, there can be multiple things treated at once. Um, we do recommend people going for once a week for at le least six weeks before they decide if it's working or not. Like with any modality, you know, we have responders and non-responders. Some people respond amazingly well, like one or two sessions are like, oh my gosh, I feel amazing. Some people take a little bit longer. It does have a cumulative effect and some people just don't have any benefits. So, but at least six sessions before you decide. Oh, and for the lymphedema, just because some of that might come up, we don't um, put needles in any kind of lymphedema site and sites can be treated. So, you know, say you have lymphedema on this arm, but you're having pain, we can treat that without putting needles in that arm um, with the lymphedema and the pain, if that makes sense. All right, so some common symptoms, right? Peripheral neuropathy, this is really, really common. Um, and acupuncture has excellent uh, benefits for this. I see a lot of really great evidence um, in research. We've done several trials um, and we have, I believe, a new one coming up as well. So certainly acupuncture for neuropathy would be my kind of first and go-to. Um, massage can also be helpful. And in this, you can actually do self-massage. So getting um, marbles or they have these textured massage balls or even um, textured rollers and massaging uh, you know, 10 minutes twice a day can be helpful. For if you're gonna use the marbles, I usually recommend putting them in kind of a, a square bucket uh, with some warm water and then just rubbing back and forth hands and or feet. And then yoga. We did a pilot study a couple months ago and we found yoga had a good benefit to, for neuropathy. We're doing a larger scale trial. So hopefully we'll show um, kind of more, more improvement of that. But uh, yeah, that's another great option. Some people will ask, I'll just stop, I'll just add this in about um, B12 or B vitamins. This is frequently recommended. But if you are not deficient in B12, then it has no benefit. The chemotherapy induced peripheral neuropathy is a different mechanism. And in fact, uh, you know, most people are able to absorb B12 from their food, no problem. And when they take it, they tend to have very high levels, which can actually contribute to worsening neuropathy. So I don't recommend that just as a general rule. Hot flashes, this is a really common uh, side effect as well. And again, acupuncture, great benefit. So again, if you have hot flashes and neuropathy, you can be treated for both. 
um, yoga has also been shown to be really helpful. And this, I think part of that comes from this mindfulness component as well. So if any of you have had hot flashes, which I'm sure at least some of you have, if you start feeling a hot flash coming on and you start getting like, oh, the hot flash is coming, you can feel it almost getting worse and worse, right? Or in times of like really intense stress can actually bring a hot flash on. So I feel this is where mindfulness can be helpful in particular. So learning how to kind of like calm the mind and body, it's not gonna like make it go away, but it will hopefully shorten the duration and intensity of it. Um, and also just trying to keep them from coming on as frequent. All right, anxiety. There's a lot of things that can help with anxiety. I think this is um, something that really needs a lot of a lot of modalities brought together because it's not really like one thing, right? So exercise has been shown in numerous, numerous, numerous studies to have a huge impact on anxiety. That's not to say that if you go out for a walk once and then like you're not going to feel anxious anymore, obviously that's not the case, but regular exercise will decrease anxiety. And I've had many people tell me like, oh, you know, I, they had to stop exercising for whatever reason and they noticed an increase in their anxiety. And then when they restarted, it definitely helps. So by all means, and then we did talk about meditation already. I will just say, I don't think meditation is, I don't want to say it's not helpful in an anxious state because it can be, but I don't recommend if you have no meditation practice, when you feel really worked up to kind of like be like, okay, now I'm just going to stop. I'm going to just not be anxious because it doesn't work. I'm sure you guys all know that. Um, right. So having the daily practice is important to help kind of prevent or or give you the skills to help deal when the anxiety comes, but not necessarily something that you want to use when you feel quite anxious. Um, journaling again, and then yoga, tai chi. There's something called progressive muscle relaxation, which is, I think, particularly helpful at night. So, I mean, can help be helpful anytime, but if you wake up at night and you kind of the mind starts going into unhelpful places, using something like progressive muscle relaxation can help kind of re, re uh, focus the mind on something else. So in that you kind of just, a couple different ways you can do it. Start from the head or the toes and then either like tighten each muscle group and release completely or just work on like fully relaxing each piece. So you think like, okay, now my feet, my feet are relaxed. Let me see if I can relax them a little bit more and then moving to the ankles and the calves. There's a lot of great meditation apps and in these guided meditations, they often will have something like this, like a progressive muscle relaxation or something that you can be guided through. And then for the yoga aspect, you know, another thing about yoga is I feel we also, we often think about people being kind of like in pretzel poses or very aggressive yoga, but there's a whole nother side of yoga there. It's called yin yoga, Y-I-N, or restorative yoga, or yoga nidra. And these are all really um, calming practices, gentle stretching, getting really comfortable in a pose and, and kind of holding it and focusing on the breath. And I think all of those are really appropriate for helping anxiety and sleep as well. Just keep an eye on the time. So, um, and now pain, um, this again, so many different ways this can come up, um, times that this can happen. And certainly acupuncture and massage are great for pain, depending on the types of pain. So acupuncture, particularly for muscle musculoskeletal pain. So joint aches and pains um, can be really helpful. Massage specifically for um, muscle pain, but also, you know, post-surgery, you know, abdominal pain, um, scar tissue, things that need to be kind of like manipulated and moved. Sometimes after surgery, we can kind of start holding our bodies a little bit differently. And then that creates pain in other areas. And massage can be really helpful to kind of like realign the body. And I hate to say it again, but I'm gonna meditation. Again, this is more along the lines of kind of re-examining our relationship with pain, right? So if 
every day we wake up with say a back pain and we're like, oh, this back pain is killing me. This back pain is killing me. Then the back pain is going to be killing us, right? As opposed to really trying to like, A, kind of come to terms with maybe a chronic pain um, and also helping to really relax the body in general can be helpful. And then topical CBD, this, you know, I will just say uh, kind of a caveat from now that I'm not going to give any specific advice on herbs and supplements, but this is topical and would be safe for pretty much everyone. But topical CBD has been shown to be helpful in a lot of cases. Um, so that's something that you could also try. And CBD, I guess I should mention, THC, CBD are different things. They're both part of the marijuana plant, but the CBD is completely no psychoactive substance. You don't need a prescription or a certification, nothing like that, completely legal and fine, regardless of where you live. So I, insomnia, as I said before, a really, really common problem. Um, I do something called cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia, and this is the gold standard for treating insomnia. And it's supposed to be used prior to any medications. Um, there is, if you look up, oh, I can't remember the name of the website, I apologize, um, but I'll give it to the um, moderators so that you guys will have it. Um, but there is a a website where you can find a provider in your area if you're interested in, in pursuing something like that. But basically this is kind of a weekly treatment where we work to undo some of the things that are contributing to insomnia and kind of reset that sleep drive and get people sleeping better. We did do a study a couple of years ago comparing cognitive behavioral therapy with acupuncture, because as I said, the cognitive behavioral therapy is the gold standard. And we found that acupuncture also had a great benefit especially for women and especially for women that had other side effects like hot flashes and pain that were keeping them up at night. So certainly something to consider there. And then again, not to be specific about herbs and supplements, but you know, we hear about melatonin so much for sleep. Um, I would say that the highest evidence for melatonin is in shift workers. So people that are work night shift and are trying to sleep during the day when they don't have a natural melatonin production. Um, or jet lag. So if you've experienced, well, I took melatonin and my sleep didn't get any better, you're not alone. That's pretty common. Um, and then CBD, some people have, you know, have been telling me lately that they, they like that for, for sleep as well. Okay. Oh, so here we go for herbs and supplements. I'm just going to show you guys, we actually have a, um, a website. Hopefully this will pop up for us without too much issue. Yep. It's called aboutherbs.com. So this is, um, we have what, how many now? 277 herbs um, or monographs on this website. This is evidence-based. So for example, we'll just pick the first one and it will tell you kind of why we use it, um, when not to take it, what warnings. And then at the very end here, sorry to make you dizzy, um, there's references. So it gives the actual kind of papers that you can look at and, and read about what, you know, what's, what the research says. Okay, perfect. Thank okay. you. Yeah, sorry about that. Um, okay, so hang on, let's go. Well, let's pick this one. That's okay. Let's do, I, so I plugged in hot flashes in this box here. That's our search box. Um, and let's say we'll look at black cohosh because this is a something that people might be interested in. So I'll tell you some evidence, right? Patient warnings. Uh, do not take if you are taking tamoxifen, chemotherapy, drugs inhibited by this. Warnings. Um, you know, this should concern, you know, a statement of caution. So you really want to be quite careful, right? But I think this is good. This is good. You know, you hear about so many things. I'm going to stop again and restart for the, the, the presentation. Um, you know, if you are on any kind of 
Facebook group or, you know, just friends and other people that are talking about different herbs and supplements. You know, I, I know people chat about this a lot. It's a good reference site because we have a lot of references there um, about the evidence. So if there is no evidence that will say that, and if you shouldn't be taking it because you're either on treatment or you have ovarian cancer. And so there's potential for estrogenic, estrogenic activity. It has it all there. Um, I would highly recommend you talk to an expert in herbs and supplements prior to initiating any treatment um, because there is just so much out there and it's a lot of conflicting evidence. So you want to have somebody that really knows what they're talking about. Okay, I've almost done. Um, this is, I just wanted to pop this up. We do have um, a new program. It's kind of a, it's a membership program. It's $25 a month. And then there's actually 20 different classes now each week that are available via Zoom. So this has just been a really nice way for people to be able to engage in fitness classes and mind body classes. You know, we have music therapy and dance therapy whilst being a stuck at home, not able to go to the gyms and it's cold outside. Um, and there's a lot of great group of people. So another good support system as well. And that is it.